In a remote corner of Syria, a sign of defiance. Supporters of the Islamic State group, held in detention since the fall of their caliphate, raise the black flag. The wives and children of IS fighters have been held here and now they vow to rekindle the movement. Baghouz, nestling on the Syrian-Iraqi border, fell in March after a pounding from coalition forces. It was hailed as the destruction of the physical caliphate, but it yielded the human remnants, the hardcore survivors of the IS experiment. Wives and families were taken to a camp in Kurdish-controlled Syria at a place called al hul The Americans are now piling up the pressure on the countries that foreign jihadists came from to take them back, and they think Britain's record has been singularly unimpressive. We know and are grateful for the fact that Italy recently announced its decision to repatriate and prosecute one fighter, but there are a number of other countries, the UK included, that have not done so. Uh, we've actually seen considerably more willingness to address this problem uh, by some other countries that don't have the same resources and that don't have the same long-standing tradition of rule of law courts, countries like Kosovo, countries like Kazakhstan. And our sense here in the United States is if countries like like Kosovo and Kazakhstan and, and others um, have the wherewithal to prosecute their fighters, then certainly prosperous Western European democracy should be able to live up to that standard too. This isn't the first time this has happened. In the mid-1990s, thousands of jihadists who'd fought in Bosnia and Chechnya were left in an international limbo. Many were stripped of their nationality, including Osama bin Laden. We've seen what happened with foreign fighters who fought the Soviets and nobody wanted them after they left and how they came together under Al-Qaeda's banner and became their own entity and created instability and attacks that changed our world. We've seen that happen before and it was only about 10,000 people who went and fought uh, along the Afghanis against the Soviets. Today, ISIS alone had more than 40 5,000 people from 110 different countries. On your knees. Get down. Get on his knees. Something similar followed the defeat of the first incarnation of the Islamic State in Iraq in the late 2000s. The leaders got to know one another in detention, including Omar al-Baghdadi. Later, they were released. So if the dangers of leaving extremists in an international limbo are clear, why won't the UK take its citizens back? In Whitehall, knowing the public hostility towards those who went to Syria, they're reluctant to do anything to facilitate their return. As for those accused of crimes, officials have told me they're worried about the possible failure of prosecutions that could lead to the undermining of the UK's counter-terrorist laws. How many people does this involve? There are believed to be more than 70,000 dependents, mostly children. The number of fighters is far smaller, and the figure from the UK of wives, children and fighters combined is thought to be just around 100. And the relatively small scale of the UK element just adds to American frustration. We're disappointed in a number of countries that have not lived up to um, the standard that we've articulated and that we have lived by ourselves. Um, we think it's a dereliction of responsibility to expect the Syrian Democratic Forces to solve this problem uh, or to expect the Iraqi government to solve this problem um, or to simply wash one's hands of the problem altogether. Every country has a responsibility 
to take back its citizens and prosecute them. That is a message that will continue to deliver to our Western European allies, um, and it's a standard that we'll continue to live up to here in the United States. Off camera, US officials have told us they are extraordinarily frustrated with Britain's failure to take back jihadist fighters and their families. The British, meanwhile, though, have agreed to the transfer of two of their citizens to the US on charges of involvement in the kidnap and murder of Western hostages for trial in the US. This is what happened in 2001 when Al Qaeda suspects revolted and took over their prison in northern Afghanistan. Hundreds were killed in airstrikes. U.S. officials now fear something similar could happen in Syria. But they also fear something much bigger among the women and children who make up the great majority of those in Al Hol. After all, there's no prospect of them going on trial. Apart from their support for IS, many have done nothing wrong. But there are troubling long-term implications. ISIS is not defeated. Physically, the caliphate uh, is destroyed. Uh, they don't have a state. Uh, but the ideology, the inspiration uh, is still there. And many people still believe uh, in the concept of uh, so-called jihad uh, that's advocated by Baghdadi and by uh, the caliphate. And you just need to see what's happening in camps like al whole camps to know how the future is going to be. So far, if we don't do anything uh, with these uh, refugees and uh, families, I think the future is going to be very dark. At al whole camp, aid agencies say their work has become increasingly dangerous. Those claiming to speak for the caliphate impose their writ over the other inmates, and videos promise a continuing struggle. The logic for dispersing these people ought to be self-evident, but it's something that many nations, including Britain, are waiting for someone else to do. Mark Urban with that report. We did ask the Home Office to join us tonight, but nobody was available. In a statement, the department said the UK was committed to seeing justice in whichever jurisdiction was most appropriate, and that sometimes that was the region where the alleged offences occurred. Joining us now, two veterans from the War on Terror's front line, Mesa Gifford, the um, pseudonym, that is, who fought against Islamic State within the Kurdish YPG militia, and the chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, Tom Tugendhat, He's in his constituency in Kent. Macy, your story is one of the most extraordinary because you went out there uh, as a volunteer to fight against ISIS. You came face to face with these people. Would you be inclined to let them back in? Well, not until we get the legislation right. Um, already the British government's record, the record on this is not good. Just one in 10 jihadis that have come back to the UK from Syria have faced uh, court. So what we really need to do is we need to uh, introduce new legislation that's going to target ISIS fighters and those that uh, have supported them. Uh, or indeed, we uh, double down our support for the SDF in Syria uh, to actually keep the Islamic State fighters who have committed crimes in Syria and Iraq in, the, uh, in sort of a prison system there. So there's a couple of different options. Are they more dangerous here, as things stand, than there? Well, it's, at the moment, the camps are quite lawless, uh, particularly in the female camps, where they've got a lot more freedom. Uh, just recently, a young girl was murdered by her grandmother. Uh, we've got cases where SDF fighters are no longer able to patrol uh, with, uh, without, uh, in, without going in significant numbers because they're being attacked by the female, uh, female jihadists. So um, there is the, the possibility that they could escape from the camps as well. There was one just a few months ago when a large body of men were able to get out of a camp and, and they tried to get to Turkey. So uh, the idea is, or at least what the SDF is calling for, is that Britain and America give a significant amount of resources so they can, first of all, keep these people in prison uh, and also create a judicial system that will be capable of trying them in the future. You don't think we are capable of that now? Not in the, not in the way we are now. I mean, they, the, the trouble is, 
there was a case just recently where a, a young lady uh, was let free from prison just after two years of, uh, of jail time. Um, there are numerous examples whereby people have escaped justice. Already there are hundreds potentially of jihadists on the, on the streets. So what we really need to do is create legislation that works and targets ISIS fighters. Do you recognise the moral responsibility that the Americans pointed out in Mark's film, that if Kosovo can do it, then for the UK to say we're not, you know, a, a, a sort of sophisticated Western country Country with a very good judicial system, it is a proper dereliction of our duty. Well, as long as, because there are, really are two paths, that it is perfectly legitimate for Britain to say that those people who committed crimes in Syria and Iraq face trial in where they committed their crimes. But what we can't do is simply wipe our hands of the situation and uh, not properly fund the SDF, who are at the moment are struggling. They're struggling to feed the hundreds of thousands of dependents and refugees that they're already feeding. Um, already the SDF have taken a pay cut, apparently, to feed the camps where something like 70,000 ISIS supporters are being held. So as well as being lawless, it's a terrible drain on resources. Let me turn to Tom Tugendhal, because I know you've been working on this pretty much for 18 months, um, three Home Secretaries in that time. Do you think that the response from the US on this that we've had tonight will change Home Office opinion? Well, I don't think this is about the US. I think this is about the UK. And Frankly, standing up for UK interests is what Home Secretaries are paid to do. And that's why I've been urging Home Secretary after Home Secretary to introduce a Treason Act, or rather an updated Treason Act. The existing one is so out of date, it's not even slightly workable. And what we need is an act that is able to, uh, as Mesa puts it, uh, use the law against people like these, who frankly have committed crimes against uh, the British people, the crime of betrayal, and once they have faced whatever punishment uh, the Syrian or uh, Iraqi authorities are uh, going to bring, uh, should they return to the UK, we can't, uh, I mean, except in the most exceptional circumstances, uh, simply turn a blind eye. These are people who have quite literally sought to raise an army uh, against us. I mean, they failed in the very early stages, thank God. Uh, but that's exactly what they've tried to do, and I see no reason it, why the British people should be exposed to the threat of them wandering around the UK. You accept, Tom, that betrayal is a very hard thing to prove. If you go into a camp and you try and differentiate between ISIS fighters and what many of them will call themselves ISIS couriers or cooks or partners, how, how do you start to know who to prosecute? Well, uh, if, you read the, uh, if the, you read the paper that I uh, wrote with Policy Exchange a few months back, uh, you'll see that uh, we, uh, not just me, but a couple of very serious lawyers as well, I'm delighted to say, uh, including Richard Eakins and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and others, uh, set out a series of uh, examples as to how to look at this. And, uh, and I'm not going to summarise it in the two moments on your programme, but the, but the truth is that there is a real threat here and there is a real challenge here to the UK authorities and as I say this isn't about the US at all frankly um, I'm not terribly bothered what they think but what I am bothered about is what uh, laws we should change to keep the British people uh, safe because this is fundamentally about the safety of the people of the United but Kingdom and, and Britain deserves much better than to see people wandering around who have uh, sought to take arms against them. So you think until the treason law is clarified or sorted out, these people should not be brought home? You would accept that we cannot try them fairly or properly under the system that is in place at the moment? Well, there are existing laws that we can use, and the government did pass uh, various laws, including a few years ago, one which uh, legislated for um, the very presence in certain areas without a fantastically good excuse, being a crime uh, of itself. Uh, and, uh, and that, indeed, can be used. And, and actually, any new treason law couldn't be used retrospectively anyway, so it wouldn't, it wouldn't make any real difference to these people. But we must expect sadly, that uh, a situation similar to this will arise again. And, and I would uh, hope that any foreign secretary, uh, sorry, any home secretary would make sure that uh, they're ready uh, should such an occurrence happen. Thank you both very much. Thank you.